Hello, and welcome to our podcast series, Conversations with Kids Peace. I'm Bob Martin. When we at Kids Peace describe the care that we provide to children who come to us for mental and behavioral health services, there's a key phrase we use, trauma-informed care. It's shorthand for the recognition of the role that traumatic experiences can play in a child's mental or emotional state. And it's a recognition that is the basis of the standard of care that we provide. But research into the impact of trauma is pointing towards another connection, and, it, and it's a fascinating one. It's a connection between trauma and physical aspects of a child's development. And there are some indications that that extends to someone's genetic makeup. To help us understand the implications of these concepts, we spoke with Dr. Ansley Schulte, the pediatric medical director for Kids Peace's Pennsylvania-based residential treatment program. Here's our conversation. Dr. Schulte, thank you for joining us. Thank really you. appreciate it. I feel the need to add a caveat before we have our discussion. You are an expert in the fields that we're going to be talking about and the issues. I am decidedly not. So, and these are complicated medical issues. We are going to be discussing them, but in a very general way. So I want to make sure all of our, um, all of our folks who are joining us understand that. Mm -hmm. So let's begin by, I'd like to ask you to kind of explain for our audience, how the body reacts to what you might call the, the two general areas of stress. There's, um, there's, there's uh, acute stress, and then there's chronic stress. What, what is the body's response to each of those? Yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, and I think really the best place to start is to define stress in general and the way that we're going to be talking about it today, which in my world is considered a physical response to a perceived danger or threat. So there are two important things there. It's a physical response. So it's causing a cascade of hormones and changes in the body in response to a perceived danger or threat. So you don't actually have to be in life-threatening danger to feel stressed or to feel a stress response. And as you alluded to, there's multiple types of stress. So acute stress can be super helpful. We all have experienced, you know, the day-to-day -day stresses that motivate us to study for tests or get to work on time so we don't lose our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of those are helpful and we need those transient elevations to make ourselves uh, get, get those things done. However, we like to think of this in medical school as the fight or flight response and the fight or flight response evolutionarily probably super helpful too, right? We right. were thinking of it in medical school as what you would need if you were going to run from a bear. So whenever we get stressed, uh, our blood flow goes from our internal organs to our extremities so that we can run or fight. Uh, it increases our blood sugar so that we have enough energy, uh, increases our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respiratory rate, all of these things change. And very helpful if you need to run away from a bear or fight off a predator. And hopefully that lasts only an hour or two. But unfortunately, we do see what's called chronic stress and more importantly, toxic stress. So chronic stress is this significant elevation in these responses over a long period of time. And notably, when those are not buffered by coping mechanisms or relationships, family members, that can lead to what we call toxic stress. And that is what leads to the changes in the brain and the body that we're going to talk about. And one of the things in our previous discussions as we prepared for this, uh, one of the statistics that you cited, which was really resonant with me, was this idea that 90% of a child's brain development happens by the time they turn five years old. Mm -hmm. And um, you also note that in a chronic stress environment, uh, perhaps as a result or as a response to trauma, um, you're, you can actually see changes in a child's brain's architecture. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could sort of ex uh, explain what happens in that situation and how is it connected to um, concerns over mental health issues. 
Absolutely. You're exactly right. So 90% of a child's brain development does happen before they turn age five. And if you've ever been around a toddler, you've probably seen this in practice. You know, they're constantly exploring the world and trying things and learning cause and effect. And in a safe and nurturing environment, they learn cause and effect and they go on and they learn coping mechanisms and they strengthen those connections in their brains that are good. And they're able to prune away or get rid of the connections that aren't super helpful. And this is why like kids are so easy to learn a language or to learn a new instrument and become a prodigy in a very short time because their brains are just constantly forming, reforming, strengthening and pruning or getting rid of these old connections. It becomes a problem when the child is exposed to a dangerous environment or a world where cause and effect shows them that bad things happen to them or people around them are maybe not the most supportive. Um, and that over time can lead to a lot of changes in the brain. And as we said, it's a use it or lose it type situation. So the ones that we're using are gonna get more strengthened. And if we're forming more connections and strengthening more connections that show us that the world is a dangerous and a stressful place, that's the way we're gonna react for the rest of our lives. So the actual architecture is, is dictating that ultimately. And as we said, once you get past really toddlerhood, mm -hmm. the die is cast as the phrase goes. That's, yes. that's it is, it truly is amazing. It is somewhat movable and we will talk a little bit more about ways we can do that. But yes, by age five, you have done most of the, the pruning that your brain will do, which is why after that age, it becomes a lot harder to learn languages and instruments and things like that. We may have to have you back at some point to talk about <laughs> the things we need to do from, you know, birth to five to make sure we we've got them on the right on the right path Absolutely. there so this idea of trauma uh influencing the brain's development in children may come as a surprise i'm sure it does to folks like me layman people aren't experts like you but you've also noted that the research is going even deeper it's it's actually investigating whether there are going to be changes in a person's dna um, so I really want to talk about that, but I think we have to define a term. So if you can give us an idea of what epigenetics, epigenetics means, I think that's a good place to start. Absolutely. Yeah. So epigenetics is a very exciting, emerging field of science uh, and biology that is finding that, so our DNA code is, is written from the time we're born, right? That's our nature. That's the little letters that we learned in biology make up our DNA. Those don't really change over time, but they are wound really tightly into these coils that make up our chromosomes. And epigenetics is the study of ways that the environment, you know, diet, toxins that we're exposed to, things like that, can actually change other structures around the DNA that causes the DNA to be expressed differently. So rather than changing the genetics or the genetic code, we're changing the epigenetics or the things that are happening around it and the way that it's expressed. From the standpoint of epigenetics, what are some external factors that could basically result in the changes that you're talking about? So really commonly, diet is a huge one. Um, that was one of the first things that we discovered. Um, there was a Dutch hunger famine in the 1940s, and there was a large cohort study of children born during that time. And it was found that they have increased risk of heart disease and schizophrenia and uh, all kinds of different health outcomes, which is very interesting. And that made people look a little closer and say, what, could, what else could be going on here? Um, but we found over time that not only diet toxins in the environment, but also our behaviors and our exposures to things like traumatic experiences can change them as well. That's, that's sort of mind boggling. It is. I, I don't mean it as a pun, but it's like, the <laughs> other is. Um, so in talking about this subject with your colleagues here at Kids Peace, uh, you showed them a video with the cryptic title, lick your rats and and we're going to sh we're going to put the uh the link to that video on youtube up on up on our video here but um can you explain first of all why you chose that particular video and what exactly is it illustrating that you thought was so important yeah so this is a, a website that was created to illustrate the findings of a really landmark study in epigenetics uh, in 2004 from McGill University, where they took two groups of rats and rats normally when they're in their pup phase, when they're little baby rats, they're licked and groomed and nurtured by their mothers and they get all kinds of feedback and you know good feelings from that. And they found that when they took two separate groups and they had a group where the rats were highly nurtured and another group where maybe the 
moms weren't allowed to lick the rats quite as much, that the rats that were not nurtured had much more difficulty later in life handling stressful experiences. So they looked a little closer and they said, what's going on here? And they found that actually the act of nurturing in the mothers causes epigenetic changes to the DNA. And in the video, you'll see that as you lick your rat, the DNA that's really tightly coiled will kind of start to very slowly unwind. And that's what allows the other proteins that actually perform gene expression to get in there and to cause the changes that lead to the better stress response. And we think that it's coded by a, a, a receptor called the glucocorticoid receptor. So in that particular study, they found a really strong correlation between mother's nurturing behavior and the glucocorticoid receptors. Wow. And I would assume, you know, taking it to another step, then, then the next generation of the rats, um, the ones who had not been uh, nurtured as much, they are they more likely not to nurture their children and therefore you have that trait getting... Yes. Get, oh, oh. Yeah, exactly. And it's very interesting, you know, that we were still doing some science and we have proven that these changes can be passed down in the DNA of other species. Um, so not mammals, but we, we think that probably this is true for humans too. But as you alluded to, it's very hard to parse out Humans have a very long lifespan. There's a lot of other factors involved. And we're not sure if this is because the epigenetic changes in the parents cause behavioral changes in them that then lead to the same epigenetic changes in their children, or if truly these changes are being passed from generation to generation. And we, we're pretty sure that there are some that are passed from, from one generation to the next. And like I said, we'll be having the link uh, to the video here on the, and it, strongly, it would be on our website, strongly recommend you take, it's only about five minutes long, strongly t take a look. It's really quite, uh, quite eye-opening. Yeah. Um, so I guess the obvious question in all of this, um, even this general discussion that we've been having, is what can we do for kids who have experienced these phys physical or even genetic changes. I mean, we can't go back in time. Um, mama rat can't go back and lick her babies more, you know? Um, so what does, where does this greater realization of the physiological implications of trauma take us in terms of treatment? That's an excellent question. And something I would say is probably the most common thing I get asked when speaking about things like this. And, the good news is it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are actually a lot of things that we can do to help foster these changes in children. And what the American Academy of Pediatrics has identified is a kind of intangible factor called resilience. And it, again, it's intangible, a little hard to define, but most people agree that it's a good outcome in the face of adversity. So what that means to individual people will be different, but we're really looking closely at how do we let these children have stressful experiences because we do need them. We do need that acute stress, as I alluded to earlier, to develop coping mechanisms and to have the opportunity to reach out to people. Because it, it would be terrible if they never had to deal with that, uh, you know, while they were building these systems in their brains and their behaviors and then had to go into a place where they did have to deal with it. Exactly. Yes. It's that, like that, a training that's, ground. That's, that's <laughs> the bears would be happy with that, but right. I don't think anybody else would. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And what we found the number one factor to increase resilience is the presence of at least one stable, supporting, loving adult. And that can be anyone in the child's life. It can be a parent, it can be a teacher, a counselor, um, employee at kids piece. Um, you know, we can make changes every day that really, influence uh, kids' brains. And they've even found, you know, even in that um, McGill University study on the rats, they found that if they later in life injected them with a drug that kind of makes those changes that their, their mother rat would have given them early in life, that they develop the ability to manage stress more easily. So it is, it is changeable, uh, but it is definitely harder the later in life you go. Okay, looking at these issues in a broader way, um, in one of our discussions, you brought up, and I thought this was really interesting, your, your perspective on this, based on your perspective as a pediatrician, that pediatric care in a therapeutic environment like that here at Kids Peace, and, and you are the uh, pediatric medical director for our residential treatment program here in Pennsylvania, you thought that this might illustrate that 
that that the practice of pediatrics in that in that environment is actually sort of a special subset of pediatric care. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so we encounter just a very particular set of complaints. <laughs> and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with those physical responses to stress. I mean, we see a lot of trauma in our population and those chronic experiences over a long term uh, really cause a lot of havoc in the body. <laughs> so in the acute term, like we said, you might decrease digestion. You know, you don't need to be using the bathroom or digesting your food when you're running from a bear, but that's really difficult when that's happening all the time and you feel that way all the time. And so we, we see a lot of like constipation and even, you know, constipation is a very common pediatric issue, but it seems to be incredibly common in our population. Um, and, you know, things, problems with heart rate, blood pressure, all these, these issues related to those chronic elevations over time given that perspective um and the advancements that we've talked about in terms of looking at physiological implications of trauma in kids and in their development what do you think the impact of that kind of focus might be for mental health care in the future I think that's a great question. And I think what we're finding is there is a much stronger brain body connection than we previously thought in Western medicine. Um, we spent a really long time. Um, one of the things that we deal with as well that I that I didn't mention is um, something called functional neurological disorders. And what that means is there's something going on neurologically. So either a child can't walk or can't see or something neurologically is happening. But with the tests that we have available, scans and blood work and all that, we cannot find an organic, meaning a medical cause in the body that is causing these symptoms. Now, some people go so far as to say, well, that means it's in their head. And that's that's not really what it means. It is it is a real thing that is happening to them. We just can't find the reason. And I think it's it's somewhat arrogant of doctors to kind of assume that, you know, because we can't find a solution or because we can't find the answer, then it must not be there. And well, I, and it's also unrealistic, sorry yes. to interruption, but it's unrealistic for the patients mm -hmm. or their parents to assume that if the doctor couldn't find it, it must not exist because the right. doctors would find everything. And and as you're saying, you know, we're still at the point of at a, you know, almost at an inflection point of what's what really is happening yes. and what that connection is. Yeah. And I think I think we'll continue to see in the in the coming years more and more of this brain body connection and just the ways that our minds can cause changes in our bodies. Well, when that happens, we're going to have you back, if you don't mind. Of course. <laughs> um, we ask each of our guests to end our conversation with a life hack. This could be favorite saying, inspirational quote. Maybe it's just a tip. We've had people tell us, well, you know, if you're if you're cutting onions, coat the coat the uh, knife with oil, and you won't cry. That's it's stuff like tip. that. So, Dr. Schulte, what, what's your life hack for us today? So I think relating to this whole conversation, I in recent years have really come to the realization that I believe that life exists in the shades of gray. So epigenetics, I think, is so beautiful because for so long we were debating, is it nature or is it nurture? Is it all DNA or is it all environment? And the beautiful thing about epigenetics is it tells us it's both. It's nature and nurture. And I've found just, you know, in my personal experiences and in my professional experiences, it seems if you're too far on one end of the spectrum or the other, too far in the black or white, you're probably going the wrong direction. And the answer lies somewhere in the gray. I think that's that's a brilliant observation, something and something that you really helps in so many different ways as you're looking at your life. Yes. So we thank you for that. Dr. Ansley Schulte is the medical, excuse me, the pediatric medical director for Kids Pieces Residential Treatment Program in Pennsylvania. Dr. Schulte, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us as well. We look forward to having you join us again for more conversations with Kids Peace. Until then, take care.